Amen, amen. Welcome, welcome, family of God. Welcome to the Blaze Bible Study with your brother, DJ Sam Brock. The Blaze Bible Study. Oh, my God. This is the morning Devo. Excuse me. The morning Devo this morning on, you know, soulwinnerswithaz.org. I'm already, you know, I'm just waking up half asleep, and but I'm here, man. And I was challenged, not me personally, but I saw a video on YouTube um, late last night of a young lady uh, that is doing well on her YouTube channel, and I was watching one of her tutorials about how to do some graphics on Canva, and the tutorial was on point. It was short, but to the point, and then, you know how the video turns to the next one of their videos? It was like, um, yeah, and I challenged myself to wake up at 5 a.m., and she's been doing it for a while now, and I'm like, 5 in the morning? I said, can I imagine myself waking up at 5 in the morning? I could hardly wake up at, <laughs> to be here at the 10 o'clock morning devotional. 5 in the morning, she wakes up, young lady, uh, younger lady, and all oh, glory to God, right? I mean, praise God for how many morning heads do we have on here? I, I want to start asking, how do you do it? How do you wake up in the morning? Do you fall asleep at 8, 9 o'clock at night? Because at 8 o'clock at night, I'm on my like second wind already. I don't wind down to like 2, 3 in the morning. It's crazy. So let me know. If you're a morning person, let me know. How do you do it? How do you get up 4, 30, 5 in the morning? I know my grandmother, when she was alive on my mom's side, amen, she was an early person. She would wake up really early. And I believe my other grandmother as well on my dad's side used to do, be, do the same. It's, I know more of my grandmother on my mom's side because I used to live with her uh, at a, a certain point in my teenage life. So I knew she used to wake up really early. Um, man, 5 a.m. I don't know. I, I don't know why, you know, and that impressed me so much, but man. So for all, shout out to all the morning people and you're looking at me like, man, it's like almost the afternoon and you're still groggy sleeping, um, fumbling your words, Sam. I said, yeah, that's because I'm a night owl. It's a different element here, man. Um, maybe I should do my, my morning devos. Technically, 2, 3 in the morning is the morning, right? So technically, I should do morning devotionals at that time. Hmm. Nah, I don't know. I'm going to try some different things out because I'm up so late. I might as well do something else. Um, but I'm working when I'm up. That I'm doing tutorials. I'm like a, one of those um, tutorial geeks, always watching tutorials to learn things. Instead of paying two, three, four thousand um, dollars for a course online, or, or going to college to paying uh, sixteen thousand dollars, or ten thousand, or six thousand um, dollars for a term, for a semester. So I'm like a tutorial um, geek. I watch tutorials all day, every day. And then apologetics, contending for the faith, learning how to defend the faith, Christianity, um, contending for the faith. Um, if it's a good apologist, I will watch it. I was on it um, yesterday with. Um, McDowell, the younger McDowell, McDowell Jr., amen, and he had a 12-year-old apologist on with him. From, his mom was Hawaiian, so he had a, a name, Nahoa Life, Nahoa Life, and that was his name, and I believe Nahoa in, Nahoa in Hawaiian means bold or courageous, 12 years old. On fire for God, knows how to, you know, contend for his faith. Amen. So all these things, you know, are happening in my mind right now. So, and I know, I know I'm thinking out loud, but you know me. You know who I am. So um, did I put up the good mornings? Good morning, Sister Joyce. God bless you. Good morning. Welcome to the Morning Devo. It's good to see you. Um, Pastor and my brother and my friend, Michael Jix. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to the Morning Devo. And Brother Damien, good morning. It's good to see you, my man. Good morning, Brother Damien. God bless you. Welcome to the Morning Devo. So let me make sure everything's up and running. Um, okay, that's good. That's good. The podcast is live as well. Uh, if you want to head over to someoneswithaz.org, the podcast is live as well. And podcast is just audio. And for all the social media people, um, you can watch the video also at someoneswithaz.org. And the advantage you have on watching a video from my website is that you have a Bible right underneath. A Bible, a live Bible right underneath the video that's active. And if you right click on your mouse or if you know how to get the options over to the side, you could open up that Bible in a separate link or in a, open it up in a new link or in a new window 
and you can have both things running at the same time. Amen. And if you have a good phone, you could actually do that from your phone as well. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So we're talking about imagining heaven. How do you imagine heaven now? Imagining heaven now. There's a reason why you are able to imagine heaven now because heaven was described in the scriptures. A small piece of heaven was a, 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 it was promised by Jesus, right? Heaven was described in the scriptures. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44. Imagining heaven now. And it makes me think, I'm like, man, do I want to, it's a, it's, it's, it's crazy. Cause it's like, I want to be here as long as I can, but heaven sounds amazing too. Right. But so it's like, uh, those thoughts that pass in your mind, I'm like, man, uh, do I want to really be here for that long? Or do I want to just go and find my place in heaven, like in a heavenly place? I'll explain that after I read the scripture. But amen. So welcome to the Morning Devo. If this is your first time, yes, I messed up early and said this was the Blaze Bible Study. This is not the Blaze Bible Study. <laughs> this is the Morning Devo. And the Morning Devo happens Monday through Friday, Lord willing, right? Um, at around 10 a.m. in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. So that means it's 7 a.m. Pacific and it's 9 a.m. Central. Also, the Blaze Bible Study, the reason why I said that, because I, I skipped it last night. Um, literally, we were out shopping in the supermarket around 10 o'clock at night, me, my wife, and my, my daughter. And it was okay, because my wife needed something. I didn't want her to go alone. It was late, and it was okay. And by the time I got back home, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be good on the Blaze. So I didn't do it last night. So the Blaze Bible Study is a nighttime Bible study. So I do 10 a.m. morning devos and 10 p.m. Bible studies. And what happens at 10 p.m. Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays is we have a Bible study, live Bible study, interactive with live call-ins and live chat. I try to do those Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sometimes I pick up from what I'm doing in the morning. Or sometimes God will just give me something different and I'll speak it out. And um, ask for responses and just for engagement because we need to have these conversations. If you choose to have them, you don't need to. I know I need to have these conversations because if I leave everything up here and not ever come out of here, then I'm going to be like, um, man, I wish I would have said this. I wish I would have said that. So I'm just spilling out everything that's in me. Amen. So that way I leave a footprint on this earth because heaven, I'm heaven bound. Amen. A lot of people right now are hell bound. And I used to be hell bound, but now I'm heaven bound. Amen. And it's a it's a weird thing. I want to stay, don't want to go. Amen. And it's just a weird thing because it's victory at the end of my life. It's victory at the end of the tunnel, right? I can see the light. Amen. So I'm gonna imagine heaven now. How do you imagine heaven? How do you imagine heaven? That's a question that um, if you wanna um, go on live on the chat and let me know. How do you imagine heaven? How do you picture heaven now? Right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or prayer requests, um, you can leave them on the podcast or right here on the live chat. And I'll see it and we'll go for it. If not, let me pray. I'll give you like 30 seconds um, to gather that up and send it. Uh, If not, in 30 seconds, I'll end up praying for this morning devotional. Amen. Um, For me to really focus on what's going on here. Amen. And to really let my mind know that I need to be alert and sound and ready for God to speak through me. Amen. So let me take a deep breath. Okay. Boom. I should be good now. And let me get to the video here so that way I can start sharing it myself. So imagine heaven now, um, that wonderful place that's described in the Bible. Very, very small description, but enough for me to be like, yeah, that's going to be all of that. That's going to be incredible. Amazing. That's going to be jaw dropping. Amen. But I could imagine heaven now. Why not? I have an imagination. You have an imagination. And it's okay to imagine things. Amen. Especially when it's endorsed, described, and it's spoken of in the scriptures, which God's word is always true. So I thank you, Lord Jesus, for today. I thank you for um, the way that we can imagine heaven now. 
I pray, Lord God, that every single person that listens or watches this morning, Devo, will be blessed by your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord God, that you would touch every single heart, that you, Lord God, will reveal yourselves to eyes that have not yet understood your salvation or you have not yet revealed yourself to. I pray that you will reveal yourself to every single person who is looking and watching and searching for the true, holy, living, loving, righteous God and just God. I pray for our queen angels, minister angels now to every single household, every single workplace, every single place where a family member of mine is found. I pray for our queen angels, minister angels, the angel of the Lord that encamps around those that love you, Lord God, so that way they could be blessed and every single person that's watching and listening, their families as well, can be blessed, guarded, protected, guided by way of Holy Spirit God throughout this journey that we have on this planet Earth. So I pray that you would give us this imagination, that you would show us in your word what, it's, what it means to imagine heaven now. And I pray this by faith because I know you answer the prayers of the righteous and the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And I pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified, magnified, I lift the name of Jesus, that you would draw all men and all women to yourself in this time, in this morning, Devo, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So let me give you all a minute to share this out, and when I come back, we'll get into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44. I'll be right back. And again, I can't imagine these minutes that go by so fast. Um, But I got to as many people as I could. Amen. And I'll get to them the rest later. Praise the Lord for the tech that we can share this with people who care. And people who don't care about the gospel, whatever, they they won't get involved and they won't chime in. But it's all good. Amen. Let's keep on doing what we do and keep on spreading the gospel message no matter who's willing to listen. If somebody's not willing to listen, um, it's like if they don't have the FOMO, right? Fear of missing out, fear of missing out of heaven, fear of missing out of the gospel. If they don't have that FOMO in them, then you can't force that on them. You know who who will not even force, God will not even force, but who convicts and convinces is Holy Spirit God. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because you could preach really well, you could... um, know Bible really well, you could um, live an upright life, a godly life in front of people who don't believe, and if they still don't decide to seek out this God, this Lord, this Savior that we talk about, they won't. I spoke about hard hearts last week, and some people have hardened hearts so hard that only God himself um, could break that heart. And break break the the body and renew and renew it, raise it up again. First Corinthians fifteen forty two forty four. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies, listen to this. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die. Right? You ever been to a funeral, a burial? But they will be raised to live forever. I'm gonna stop right here for a second. Can you imagine? You had a funeral. Uh, thank you, Power, in the name of Jesus, for sharing this out. And thank you, um, Pastor Terry, for sharing this video as well. Can you imagine you're at a funeral? I always imagine this because I, I literally thought that one time this was going to happen. When my second daughter had passed, um, I was believing in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ to raise the baby from right before um, the morgue. Actually, we went. You want to talk about believing? And God, no matter what, 
our second daughter, Faith, had passed on. She was in CHOP, so they had her in the um, cooler. Whatever you call that thing that they put your body in this refrigeration. And God told us to go, me and my wife and some other people that believed in the resurrection power, and raise the baby out of that morgue. Problem was that when we went, they wanted to know why we were there. We went at an odd time. They knew who we were, you know. And they were like, what are you doing here? Security came and everything. I said, can we see our child in the morgue? They were like, no, we, we can't do that. Okay, I said, can we see the baby one last time? They were like, no, you can't do that. So what we tried to do, and this is where we got a little off track. We tried to sneak into um, the floor where the babies were. And then we was going to look for the baby and open the thing and pray the baby back to life. You might think that's far crazy. Um, but we believe in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we made an attempt. And before that, uh, no, after, well, after the preparation, they prepared the body for uh, the casket. Um, before they did that, um, but we went another route for reasons that are personal. And we went to that place too. And they thought we were crazy. Listen, let me just tell you something. The power of God is available. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. The scripture says it. So it's not that crazy for us thinking that we could lay hand, lay hands on a dead person and they would come back to life. Ultimately, right, that power belongs, to, ultimately a power belongs to God. But the scripture does say that we have that same spirit. So reason why a Christian would do that or imagine that to be possible is because God says we have the same spirit that Jesus was raised by. I'm just saying, I know it sounds crazy, but when I when I say it out of my mouth, because I've actually done, tried it and done it, well, you, you probably say, well, did the baby come back to life? No, the baby did not come back to life. Well, I know one thing that came back to life. I remember I was, I was invited to uh, preach at an event and... Holy Spirit fell upon on my heart at that moment. And although, and this was afterwards, although the baby did not come back to life, I laid hands on my wife's stomach by the power of Holy Spirit. And I asked um, her stomach, her wound and everything to come back to life. And now we have two children later, later it happened later, but we have two children uh, alive and well. Could it be that the resurrection power when I laid hands on my wife and declared that her womb would come back to life, could it be that that power was put everything back to, to normal in my wife's system and her body so, so we could have these miracle babies? Could it be? I imagine heaven now. Why? Because heaven is in a believer. Heaven belongs to us. Amen? So let's go back. First Corinthians, I'm in 1 Corinthians 15, 44. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. Come on. Buried in brokenness. So imagine you're at a funeral and everybody's sitting down and the body comes back to life. I don't know what you would do. I don't know what I would do. Um, if it's a, a homegoing party for a believer, we'll be celebrating the fact that that person came back to life. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the person will be celebrating coming back from Seeing heaven and coming back here, back to earth. I'm not sure. Me personally, I'd be like, leave me alone. I'm good. Look at this wonderful place. Don't try to bring me back. Don't try to bring me back. Amen. I'm just saying, I'm imagining heaven now. Excuse me. Well, I imagine. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. See how this is working out? Buried in brokenness. Raised in glory, buried uh, in weakness, raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, right? Of course. The Bible's truthful. We're buried as natural human bodies, right? But they will be raised as spiritual bodies. So we have this earthly bodysuit right now, but later we will have a spiritual body. Body suit. We have an earthly body suit on now, flesh and bones. And then when we're heaven ready, 
we're heaven bound, we will have a heavenly body, a spiritual body. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The word of God says it. We just read it. People think that it's all going to be, you know, oh, you know, you live, you're born, you suffer, you die. You know, your body goes to the ground, turns back into dirt, and that's it. A lot of people think that way. They have no hope of eternal life. They have no hope of heaven. They have no hope at all. And then they try to convince other people, yeah, man, don't believe in those Christians. They just put that there. The God of the gaps. They don't know what happens after they die, so they fit God in there. They put God in every single place where we, we don't know uh, for sure. As if Christians created uh, this message, as if we invented this. Listen, I'm going to say this to, I'm blue in the face. People who say that the Bible was used to control society, this and that and that. I still, nobody has, has answered this question. For what benefit would it be for men to write uh, a book about a God that we serve. If I, if men, if I would have wrote the, the Bible to control people or whatever, or to try to manipulate, you guess who would have been the God in, in the scriptures? I would have been the God in the scriptures. Man would have been the God in the scriptures. Not a God that's outside of us, right? And a God who has his, his morality is from outside. It, it, it wouldn't make any sense. You create something to control people or you create something to manipulate people. Ultimately, it should be about you, the person who created it. But the Bible has over, what, 14, 1500 years of history, over 40 authors. Uh, Some authors we don't even know. Some books we're not sure who wrote the book. Amen. But there's at least 40 authors, 1500 years of history, has prophecy which is a big problem with those who say the Bible is not real or the prophetic word that's found in the scriptures that literally came to pass, undeniable, right? You have the redemption message all the way from Genesis to Revelation, um, the only book that has a savior who was born from a virgin, lived a life, died on a cross, and then raised from the dead uh, on the third day. Only one like it. It's authentic. It's real. Uh, has places that you could literally go to, places mentioned that you literally could get on a plane and go to now and see the place. Or how about this? The fig tree that Jesus, right, cursed because it wasn't bearing fruit. Uh, Archaeologists and people who tour these places in Israel, Palestine and all these places, uh, they say they pinpointed that place where that tree was cursed by the Lord and to this very day that whole area it's desolate. It could be built upon. People could build on it, but it's still there, desolate, still cursed. Um, but yet, people are going around saying that, oh no, you made Jesus up, you made God up. Um, you need God to exist for your whole life to play out the way you want it to play out. Like, as if I got up one day and I was like, okay, I want to be a Christian now and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guide myself and I'm going to fill myself with this spirit other than me. It's almost, well, it's impossible. People say, oh, you changed because you was always a good guy, Sam. I changed. If I could have changed, I would have changed myself. Why wouldn't I? Like, this is incredibly crazy what the way people think. But we hear in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, 44. How do you imagine heaven? How do you imagine that the resurrection of the dead is available to us? That we'll be raised from the dead? How do you imagine that our earthly bodies... Even though we know a lot of people choose cremation, other people choose burial with the casket and all that. Either way, our bodies are going to decay and our bodies are going to be turned to dirt, to ash, right? And we're going to come back. How do you imagine that? One time I had a dream. I don't know if it was a vision or a dream um, that I saw people die and come back to life. Like, like in a spirit. But their bodies were like them. Like it would be my face. Everything would be the same. Only thing is a certain thing. Like a glow. A certain certain way. That is almost like a prepared body. To be raised and to go to heaven. And I saw angels like rushing before me. I don't know if it was me. Like I said I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. I don't even think it was me. I think it was just people. People that are in heaven. That how they made the entry. I saw angels in front of them, 
right? Getting everything out of the way, and they were getting um, directed to heaven. Now, there was one time I was asked because I was I was struggling um, with losing my last daughter because I was my first daughter in 1998. I was I was out there. I wasn't saved. I didn't believe in Jesus. Um, nothing. I was just somebody else. And I expected that as something that we deserved punishment for the way we were living. And it hurt because my first daughter died in my arms in the hospital on 17th and Chu. Um, it was called Lehigh Hospital. What is that called? Lehigh, I don't know what it's called. The hospital on 17th and Chu. I don't like to think about it too much. But I wasn't saved. And, but we had Christians that would come. And pray for our daughter. And every time they would come and pray at the best side of our daughter, the doctors would be amazed how all the vitals would go back up and, and everything would change around. And then when they would leave and then when, when I would surround her with me and my wife, everything would go back down. I don't know what that's all about. All I know is that when they prayed, this is what I know. And the doctors will testify uh, and tell you they will actually uh, recommend or they were actually, yeah, they wanted those people to come back. I said, can the people who just prayed, can they come back? Where are they from? And I saw oh, they're from church. And, and they were amazed at every time they would come and pray. But then when we would sit down around the baby, me and my wife, we were broken up. We were out there. Uh, we had the world. Just We were just in the world. And we would all see everything go back down. So anyway. One day we took her to uh, an appointment. We were checking some things. Things were looking okay. Um, it was no hope for that child. They 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 expected her only to live for two and a half months or two weeks or something like that. And because of the prayers, I believe it was the prayers of the righteous that was availing availeth much. It was doing something. It was happening. God was showing His power. Um, maybe it was for those nurses and doctors to see. God's power because maybe they were so out of touch with God or maybe it was to lift up the faith of the believers that were coming to pray or it was definitely for me and my wife to see the power of God but uh, I know I don't, can't speak for my wife but I wasn't interested amen my wife says she was saved in 1997 I was saved in 2001 amen when I truly received the Lord and Savior Jesus so they would come they would pray writers would go up then they would leave I would sit by the baby and everything would go back to normal. So anyway, so we went to our appointment. They checked, you know, and they said, oh, you know, the baby's okay. You could take her back home. She had a 24-7 nurse, uh, nursing service. And I wasn't with my wife at the time. We wasn't even married at the time. Um, but then they had called us right back. Like, after we left. Um, yeah, because they still had the baby. And we were about to go pick her up. I guess we was going to go to eat or something. But they said, you have to come right back. And when we came back, um, she was her heart rate was going and she was dying. And the doctor said, well, we could, you know, uh, put, you know, they were all rushing. It was right there in, in like, in the lobby area. They were rushing. The doctor said, listen, we could give her a shot of adrenaline in her heart and then rush her to chop. And then we could try to, you know, do this down the third. I looked at the doctor. I was like, man, this is this is too much for uh infant to go through she already went through all these you know these uh, you know needles and all that stuff and she was in tremendous amount of pain according to what the doctor said so I said listen that's it you know let her go let her go and so they gave me the baby and she took a last breath in my arms messed me up broke me grown man crying like a baby you know it was tough you would think that that would break me, that that would break my heart enough to run to the people who tried to pray life and the resurrection power over my daughter. My heart was so hard at that time that I looked at her, I, you know, it hurt, but, you know, I, you know, I just wasn't at the place where I'm going to receive anything from God. That's a broken person, a broken person, and, and, and it took... From 1988 to 2001 for God to finally put me back together. Because I was broken. I was angry all from 15 years old. A lot of people know my testimony. All the way to 30 years old. Angry person. You would not know though. Because I was always smiling, joking. Um, You know, 
I was that guy that just wanted to just help out and make sure everybody was cool. But I was, I me myself, I wasn't cool at all. So I wasn't good. I wasn't um, you know, good in a good place, good space. I was a totally different person than I am now, and that's all glory to God how He changes people, transforms people, renews things, and and works with the heart and transfers or transforms our heart from hardened hearts onto a heart that's pliable, that's workable, right? And God can only do that by way of his Holy Spirit. Amen? So I imagine heaven as a place where none of that stuff is going to happen. It's going to be no lack, no pain, no suffering, no tears. <clears throat> there might be tears, I believe. Not for sure, because I'm not the one who planned this all out. God is the one who planned this all out. But I think we're going to have tears of happiness. I don't think it's going to be tears of sorrow of people who are not with us in heaven because that would be kind of like a little torment, right? It would be a forever <clears throat> and heaven thinking about, oh man, I wish so-and-so would have made it to heaven. I wish um, this person was here or that person. I think that would be like torment. And I think that would turn into um, depression and, and all those other things that go along with that. Sadness. I don't think that's in heaven. But I believe that as we're heading there. Amen. On um, that little time and that little space. This is what I believe. Uh, I believe that we'll, we'll be crying. Amen. I don't know if it's cheers of joy or cheers of sorrow for people that we're hoping is going to be there on the other side. But let's see. We're going to find out, right? Sooner or later. So I imagine heaven as a place where it's all light, no darkness, that it's uh, for all eternity. Heaven is going to be displayed. Jesus is going to be sharing a different part of himself for all of eternity. Amen. Um, mansions, the desires of my heart. So the mansion is going to have, my mansion is going to have speakers in the walls, DJ sound system from the future. Amen. People just hanging out, having a good time, a holy good time, righteous good time, listening to music and, and all that. That's how I imagine heaven now. Amen. And also when somebody needs heaven, I believe we are the heaven carriers. I believe we carry heaven around as a believer with us. Amen. So we could experience a little bit of heaven by encouraging somebody, by speaking the word over someone, by praying for someone, for asking the Holy Spirit God to move upon a life. And they can experience heaven now. So imagine heaven now. How do you imagine heaven? Amen. And I hope, you know, this doesn't come at a time where you're contemplating something different. I'm not, I'm not talking about um, imagine hell now. And for all those who feel that they're hell bound, but yet they're saved. Listen, let's pray because that spirit that's saying that you're going to hell when you're a born again Christian, it's not from God. God is not playing those games with his people. God doesn't play games at all. God, what he, God says is. So when God says, speaks about heaven in the scriptures, talks about resurrection in the scriptures. Amen. Talks about it in uh, Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth. God means it. Oh, that's all, you know, metaphorical. That's all, you know, just image of what could be. And Listen, if God said it, it is. Now, however we interpret it or however, however much we understand it, that's our limits. God is limitless. Heaven is real and heaven is my home. But while I'm here, you know, passing through, I'm going to spread this message to as many people as I can because I truly believe it. I live this thing. I'm a born again Christian. I really live it. Amen. I'm a saint that sometimes sins. I'm no longer a sinner saved by grace. Amen. I'm a saint, not a sinner. God changed my identity through the Lord Jesus. And now he reminds me of my identity by Holy Spirit. And Father God governs it all. Amen. We have three in one, one God. So we are good in faith. We are good in Christ. Outside of that, I was watching the movie Outside of the Wire, right? A sci-fi movie. And there was a certain place where they could be safe. And then as soon as they stepped out of that wire fence, they were on their own. You know, all guns blazing. Got to be a full war alert and stuff like that. I believe in the kingdom of God. Amen. We're safe as soon as we get out the kingdom doors. Amen. And want to do our own thing. All guns blazing. This war. Um, and a lot of things could happen outside of that. Amen. 
So I have no problem with staying inside the kingdom. Amen. But I will reach out if God tells me, okay, it's time for you to open the gate and go outside the kingdom and reach people with the gospel no matter what. I'm all for it. You know, send me, Lord. I'll go. So imagine heaven today. Imagine heaven now. Amen. How do you imagine heaven now on the morning Devo? So I hope this blessed you. Hope this got you thinking. Amen. But I really want you to get into this scripture. First Corinthians chapter 15. Read the whole thing for yourself. It's powerful. And you will be changed. And your mindset will even change. Let's focus on the things of God and heavenly things. Amen. So that way we can always be hopeful for the future. Amen. And I live in the past, but live in the present and going forward. In Jesus' name. So God bless you. God keep you. I hope you were blessed. And remember always that God, he's good. Peace.